today we're continuing in this series called The End Times. Ooh, right? And we've been talking about some of this stuff that we see happening in the world around us. We've been talking about some of the stuff that many people are talking about from all the chaos and all the turmoil and all the things in the world. How many know people are interested in this idea of the end times, right? In fact, everywhere you look, people are talking about it. They're kind of so-called, you know, self kind of prophets out there that are all over YouTube and all over blogs and all over the internet and everyone has their take on every current event and how it fits in with prophecy and all that kind of stuff and how many know sometimes it can get a little bit confusing right and with everything that we see in the world today it really does kind of lead to that question are we in the end times are we living in the last days and so last week we just did our best to kind of try to answer that question from a biblical perspective and if you missed last week let me just catch you up what we discovered last week is that the signs that Jesus gave us point to the fact that we are in the last days everybody look at your neighbor and say come on we're in the last days We are living in the end times, and that can be a little bit kind of scary, can make you feel a little bit anxious, except for that. Last week, we learned some perspective from the scripture, and here's what we learned from the book of Hebrews, is that the last days are not just what are happening right now, but actually the last days are the end times actually started way back when Jesus died and rose again, that the end times started that moment that Jesus rose from the grave, and they will continue all the way to that moment when Jesus returns to this earth. And how many know that's a wide span, right? And so sometimes we can think, well, we're in the middle of it right now and it's all happening right now and it all has to happen right now. But here's the thing is that it's been happening for the last 2000 plus years. And that kind of gives us a biblical perspective on the timeline. And it helps us with some of our fears and some of our anxieties. And we understand that some of the signs that we're seeing in the world, the people of the Bible were seeing some of those same signs and some of those prophecies that that are in the Bible have already happened. Some are still to happen. And so here's what we discovered, that the end times are not something to be afraid of, but those of us who are followers of Jesus, come on, the end times are actually something to look forward to. Come on, isn't that hopeful kind of news? And so it's not something to be afraid of. It's not something for us to be anxious about. It's actually, if we are followers of Jesus, come on, it is hopeful good news and so that's why we are studying it and today we're going to dive into it a little bit more by studying everybody's favorite end time book today we're going to dive into the book of revelation so everybody say revelation the book of revelation now how many of you have ever read in the book of revelation before come on raise your hand how many know there's a lot of stuff in there come on you know what i mean like as you read the book of revelation it can kind of be a little bit scary it can kind of make you feel a little bit anxious sometimes it can be a little bit intimidating in fact i will just tell you the truth today i feel a little bit intimidated to preach about it today because man there is so much in there and if anybody tries to tell you they understand it all they're lying because they don't I'm just saying doesn't matter how much you have studied it there's a lot in the book and it's it's really interesting and and over the years there's been so many times that that people have said pastor preach on the book of revelation tell us about what's going to happen in the end times tell us about revelation and I understand why people want that because man it's interesting as you read it there's dragons and there's beasts and there's antichrist and there's mark of the beast and there's numbers and there's symbols and there's 12 stars stars and there's 10 horns and there's seven heads and there's six wings and there's four bowls and there's two olive trees and there's a partridge in a pear tree. I'm just saying like, (laughs) it's all in there. You know what I mean? And so you read that stuff and it's like overwhelming and kind of hard to decipher and kind of hard to understand. And then when you kind of look at what's happening in our world today and politically and with the wars, wars that are happening in the world, just all this stuff that's happening, it can kind of make you a little bit afraid. Some people get a little bit freaked out, but here's what I want to help you with today, that the book of Revelation is not something scary. It's actually something that will build our hope and build our faith 
faith. In fact, in Revelation 1, right out the gate, John tells us that there is a special blessing for those who read and study the book of Revelation. So here's what I'm believing. As we read and study from the book of Revelation today, I'm believing there is a special blessing that we're going to receive as a part of it, right? So I'm ready to dive in. Come on, are you ready? Just tell me, I'm ready. Come on, I'm ready. Ready to dive in. Let me just set it up for you so you'll kind of understand the context of what is happening in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was written by one of the disciples, a man named John. John was actually the last living disciple when he wrote the book of Revelation. All the other disciples had died. Of course, we know Judas hung himself. Then the other disciples were actually martyred for their faith in Jesus. And here's John. John, the emperor, tells all the people that they have to bow down to him and they have to worship him like a god and john basically says i've seen god and he ain't you and i'm not bowing down and because he decides not to worship the emperor he's actually exiled to an island the island of papyrus or papyrus is it patmos the island of patmos and while he's on the island of patmos god meets him in that place and he has a vision or a revelation of things to come Actually, what it really is, is it is a revelation of Jesus. In fact, we call it the book of Revelation, but I think it should be called the book of the revelation of Jesus. Because what happens is that God shows him all these things that are to come. But what he's really showing him is he's showing him a revelation of who Jesus was, who Jesus is, who Jesus will be in the end times, and who he will be forever and ever and ever and ever. And so what we're going to attempt to do today in the next 25 minutes, we're going to attempt to break down this, I mean, very dense book with lots of stuff in there, but I think I can break it down into five parts, and in these five parts of the book of Revelation, I think we can see five different things that are are revealed to John and revealed to us about Jesus, about who he is, who he was, who he will be in the end times, and who he will be forever. So we're going to dive into this, and we're going to go lightning fast today. You ready? So get your notes out, get it ready to write these things down today as we discover from the five different kind of parts of the book of Revelation, we see five things about the revelation of who Jesus is. Number one, this is what John, what is revealed to John by the Spirit is this, is that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, and he is returning soon. In fact, I love this. Check this out. Revelation 1. Here's where it starts in verse 7. It says, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Can I just tell you something today? Jesus is going to return. And when he's talking about the return of Jesus here in Revelation 1, let me just make sure that it's clear. He's not talking about Jesus' first return, which is what we know as the rapture, when Jesus will come for his church. But what he's actually talking about here is he's talking about the second return of Jesus, when Jesus will return not for his church, but he will return with us, his church, and will set up his rule and his reign forever here on this earth. Come on, that's amazing. And look what it goes on to say in verse number seven. And even those who pierced him and all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be a man. I am the what? I am the alpha and omega, says the Lord, who was and who is and who is to come, the almighty. Jesus says to John in this vision, I want you to know I am the alpha and the omega. Now, what does that mean? Some of you go, I don't understand what does that mean. Well, the word alpha was actually the first letter of the Greek alphabet. And the word omega is actually the last letter of the Greek Greek alphabet. If we were to take it into the English alphabet, it would have been like Jesus was saying, I am the A and the Z. What was he saying? He was saying, I am the first and I am the last. I was there at the beginning when everything was created. I've been there through all of it, and I am there at the end. I have already been the author who has planned the end, and so I was there at the beginning. I'm there in the middle, and I will be there till the end. Come on, how many know that's hopeful news? so many times we can look at our social media and we can watch the news and we can see what's going on in the world around us and we see all the signs of the time and we can get overwhelmed and we can think what's it going to be like in the end and are we going to make it in the end and is God going to be faithful in the end and Jesus told us come on through this vision hey I was there at the beginning but I'm also going to be there at the end so you have nothing to fear come on that's powerful 
Let's keep reading verse, one, verse 12. He says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe reached down, uh, reaching down to his feet and with golden sash around his chest. His hair uh, on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. And his feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of the rushing water. And in his right hand, he held seven stars. And coming, listen to this, coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun and shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I I hold the keys of death and Hades. Come on, if that doesn't fire you up, I don't know what does. I mean, first of all, he describes him. He says, I saw Jesus and this is what he looked like, man. What did he look like? He had eyes blazing with fire. Come on, he had hair that was like wool, white as snow. His feet were like bronze. His voice was like the rushing thunder. And then, man, he's got a sword, double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Come on, I'm telling you, sci-fi ain't got nothing on the book of Revelation. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he looked amazing. He looked awesome. And then what does he say? He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. And then listen to the gospel message that's in this vision from from Jesus to John. Look what he says. He says, I am the living one. I was dead. But now look, I am alive forever and I hold the keys to death in Hades. Listen to that. What was Jesus saying? Jesus saying, hey, they tried to get me down. They tried to kill me. They tried to put me in the grave, but death couldn't even hold me down. Why? Because I'm the alpha and the omega. I have conquered death and I am coming back to rule forever and ever and ever. And what does John do? John does what I think every single one of us would do. If we saw Jesus in that state, if we saw Jesus with a sword coming out of his mouth and with eyes blazing like fire, what would every one of us do? We would do exactly what John did. He bowed down to worship. And it's interesting here. This John that we're talking about is the John that is known as John the Beloved. Ever heard that before? This was the one that Jesus loved. Now, of course, Jesus loves all of us, and Jesus loved all the disciples, but there was something special about Jesus and his relationship with John, and yet in this moment, even John the Beloved, when he saw Jesus in that moment, it wasn't buddy, buddy, Jesus is my homie, I love him, I'm the Beloved. No, it was every knee will bow and every tongue, come on, I gotta bow before Jesus when I see a vision of who he really and truly is. And that's why it's important we study this stuff, you guys. That's why even though this is a little different than the kind of message that we would normally do, it's important for us to get a vision, a revelation from God, from his word of who Jesus is. Come on, he is the alpha and the omega, and he is returning soon. And that's what John sees in this vision. But notice in the second part of the book of Revelation, we see this second thing about Jesus, and that is that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Everybody say, Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God, and He is worthy. Now, what does that mean, Lamb of God? Well, as we begin to study this in chapter 4 and chapter 5, John has this, has this vision, this revelation, and in the vision what he sees is he sees God up on his throne. And as God is on his throne, what he is doing is he's holding this giant scroll, and the scroll is sealed with seven seals. And naturally, John is like any of us. He's curious, and he wants to know what's inside the scroll. And so the angel says, is anyone worthy to open up the scroll? And they began to look around. And obviously, John is saying, I'm not worthy. And the angel's saying, I'm not worthy. And it seems as if no one is worthy to open up the scroll. And John is upset because no one can open the scroll until in the vision we see in Revelation 5 and verse 6, he says, I saw a lamb looking as if he had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and elders. And the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. 
And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. And each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain for your blood. You, with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nations and you made them into a kingdom uh, and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Now I know there's a lot of stuff in there. There's bowls and there's scrolls and there's horns and there's all this stuff. But here's the point here is that John says and the angel says, is anyone worthy to open up the scroll? And they look around and no one is worthy until they see the lamb, the lamb who was slain. Now, we know today, who was that lamb that it was talking about? It's talking about Jesus. That Jesus was the lamb who was worthy to open the scroll. And why was he worthy to open the scroll? Because he was slain for the sins of the world. See, here's what we don't understand in our kind of American kind of view of Christianity, but they would have understood in those times as Jews, they would have known that we were all, that we're all sinners. And in order for sin to be paid for, there had to be a payment for the penalty of that sin. And so what they would have to do is they would have to take a lamb, a lamb without any spots, a spotless lamb, and they would have to present the lamb as a sacrifice. And that lamb would have to be slain and blood would have to be spilled out. And that lamb would then would then somehow pay the penalty for their sins and so every every so often they would have to come to the temple and they'd have to bring this lamb and they'd have to lay it on the altar and they'd have to slay the lamb so that they could have forgiveness of their sins but when Jesus came to this earth come on he became the perfect spotless lamb once and for all (laughs) And he went to that cross and he died for us that even though we are sinners, that even though every single one of us have sinned and deserve to die because of our sin, the wages of sin is death, but Jesus took our sin upon him and he became the lamb that was slain for us. He is worthy because he gave his life for the sins of all of the world to purchase every tribe and language and people and nation. Come on, that's something to get excited about today, all right? The book of Revelation. In Revelation, it is revealed to John the revelation of Jesus that he is the Alpha and the Omega, that he is the Lamb of God that is worthy, that number three, he is the righteous judge. Everybody say righteous judge. He is the righteous judge, and he will judge the earth. Now, let me just tell you something. When we get into this section of the book of Revelation, this is where it gets crazy. This is where we start getting into all the stuff that everybody that comes for an end time series is wanting to hear about. This is where we get into the 666 and the mark of the beast and all the, all the, book, the apocalypse and all the crazy stuff that we're looking for in the book of Revelation. In fact, I'll tell you, if you're watching YouTube videos or looking up end time stuff and they're talking about the end times, they're probably talking about Revelation 6 through 18, this section of Revelation. In fact, I'll just give you a couple of highlights of, of this section of Revelation. It's in this section where the temple in Israel is going to be rebuilt. It's in this section where the beast begins to rise up. We call him the Antichrist. The Bible actually never uses that name, just calls him the beast. But he begins to rise up and he institutes the mark of the beast. And people have to take this mark upon them in order to be able to buy and sell and trade. And then there's these two guys. These dudes are awesome. The two witnesses and they show up and they start performing miracles and they start preaching and then actually they are killed but they are raised again from the dead. I mean it's awesome stuff. This is where the battle of Armageddon is taking place. Like this is crazy stuff that's happening in these few chapters of the Bible. It's the stuff that you can kind of really got to get into and try to argue over and all that kind of stuff. But let me tell you something, even in all of that crazy stuff that happens in these couple of chapters, let me bring it back to what it's really all about. It's all about the main theme and the main theme is Jesus. And in these chapters, what we see is this aspect of who Jesus is, that Jesus is not only the Alpha and the Omega, he's not only the Lamb of God, but he is also a righteous judge. And he will judge the earth for its sin. In fact, 
through those few chapters, we began to see some of the different judgments. I'm not going to go in depth into them today, but I'll just mention them and some of the things that are going to happen. We see the seals judge or the seal judgment. And in the seal judgment, this is where we hear about the four riders of the apocalypse. This is where we hear about the moon that turns blood red. It's in this that where, where there's all kinds of war and many people are dying because of war. It's in this seal judgment that about a quarter of the world's population will die from famine and plagues and wild beasts. I mean, pretty bad stuff as the judgment of God comes on the earth. Then we move from the seal judgment to the trumpet judgment. And in the trumpet judgment, it just keeps getting worse because you got hail that's mixed with fire and blood that starts to fall down from the sky. You talk about end of days. I'm telling you, there's these poisonous locusts that come, creepy kind of stuff. There's about a third of all the vegetation of the earth that is destroyed. Another third of the water is contaminated. Another third of the sea creatures die. Another third of all the light is actually lost and it becomes, it becomes becomes pretty much darkness over all the land. A third of all of the people in the world will die during this trumpet judgment. You talk about bad times. That God begins to judge the earth, and yet even in the midst of his judgment in this tribulation, his grace is still extended to those that call out upon him. That's how gracious of a God he is. Then we move into the bowl judgment, and sores begin to appear on people who have the mark of the beast. And the water of all the earth begins to turn to blood and everything in it dies. And the sun scorches people and there's a devastating earthquake earthquake and a hundred pound hail. You think we've seen some softball hail. Come back. Can you imagine a hundred pound pieces of hail begin to fall from the sky? Now I know what some of y'all are thinking. Now I don't like this part. Like this doesn't sound right. Like why would a loving God have this kind of judgment on the earth. I know some of y'all are saying that doesn't seem very fair. And yet I think it really is fair. I mean, how many of you have known someone who did something really bad or have heard of someone who did something really bad and they got off and didn't have to pay for what they did? And what would we say when that happens? We would say, that's not fair. Don't you know what they did? And here's the thing is so many times we push back and go, well, God is a loving God and God is a gracious God and God is a gentle God. And yes, that is a part of who he is. Come on, he can't change that. He just is good. That is, that is what he does because that's who he is. He is filled with grace. And yet at the same time, the part that sometimes we don't like to talk about and preach about is this, is that not only is he a loving God and a gracious God, he is also a just God and a righteous God. And he cannot allow sin to go unpunished. Not that he will not. He cannot because that is his nature. And it's almost as if God knew that we would struggle with this. And so look what the angel says in Revelation 16 and verse 5 through 7. And then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in all these judgments. O Holy One, you who are and were. For you have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have been given them blood to drink as they what? As they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The angel says, Even these difficult judgments, even these things that will come in the tribulation, the judgments of God, they are as is deserved because sin deserves a payment. Sin deserves a justice, a judgment, and God is a righteous judge. And we see this picture of who he is as we study the revelation of Jesus that he is the Alpha and the Omega, he is the Lamb of God. He is the righteous judge. But then this leads us to number four, and that is this, that Jesus is the King of kings, come on, and the Lord of lords who will return for his church. Man, it all leads to this, that he's the King of kings, 
He's the Lord of Lords. In fact, we see in Revelation 19 in verse 11, it says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. And with justice, he judges and wages wars. His eyes are like blazing fire and his head, on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. And the armies of heaven were following him riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen white and clean coming out of his mouth here it is again a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with an iron scepter and he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the almighty God and on his robe and on his thigh is written the name king of kings and lord of lords Let me just tell you something. There are a lot of things that try to be king in our life. There are a lot of things that try to be Lord in our life. There are a lot of things that we try to put on the throne of our life. But one day Jesus is going to return. Come on. And he's going to take his rightful place and he will rule over all of them. For he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And here's what's so cool. Everybody nudge your neighbor and tell them, this is what's cool. Come on. This is what's so cool. If you are a follower of Jesus today... He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he will rule. But guess what? We get to rule with him. <laughs> when that time comes, come on. Look what the scripture says. Peter says like this in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. For you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Come on, that he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but because of what he has done for us, he has made us a royal priesthood. Come on, he has made us kings in his kingdom. He has made us priests in his priesthood. Come on, in Revelation 1, 6, John says it like this, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, he has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father to the glory and the power for, of him forever and ever and ever. Come on, I love it that he's the king of kings. Come on, that means that there's no king of this earth that he is not over, that he is king of every king that ever was and ever will be. But guess what? It also has another meaning, that he has made us kings in his kingdom. Come on, we are his kings, we are his priests, and he is our king, and we will rule this earth together one day in the last days. Come on. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Lamb of God. We are revealed in this, in this book of the Bible that he is the righteous judge, but he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords and will return for us and we will rule with him. Why? Because number five, look at this last revelation that, that John has, that Jesus is the bridegroom. And we, come on, the church, we are the bride. I love this. In fact, in Revelation 21, look what it says in verse 9. It says, And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came to me and said, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian in this place today, as a part of the church, guess what you are? You are the bride of Christ. He is the groom. We are his bride. And one day he will return for us. Come on, and we will have a union like no other. In fact, when I think about this, I can't help but think about my beautiful bride who normally sits right there on that front row and has to listen to me preach two times every Sunday. Amen. She's not here today because not only is she an amazing bride, but she's also an amazing mother. And our son woke up uh, throwing up this morning. So pray for my son and pray for my wife and for me when I get home today. Amen, right? (laughs) But when I think about this, like I can't help but think about what it was like when Amber and I first started dating. Come on, how many remember what it was like when you first started dating? Like all we wanted to do is be together. All I wanted to do is talk to her, hang out with her, spend time with her. And it was hard because I was in college and she was still at home and we were five and about five hour drive away. And it was back in those days. Man, I remember, like I remember, I would have pictures of her and I'd think about her all the time. And, you know, I, the picture that I have of her is in her bootleg jeans and her, you know, Doc Martin sandals, you know, and I'm wearing my, wearing my cargo pants from Old Navy. It was the 90s, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And I remember what it was like in college, like I couldn't wait to go home on the weekends. We'd talk on the phone all the time. And it wasn't like 
Man, these kids have no idea today, right? Because we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have smartphones. We couldn't FaceTime each other. We couldn't call each other like that. I had to have a long-distance card on AT&T. And I'd sit in the hallway of the dorm and wait for somebody else to get off the pay phone so that I could call her and talk on the pay. And man, I loved her so much. All I could think about was being with her. And then when we got engaged, all I could think about was that Man, come on, that time when I would walk that aisle and we would stand there and we would pledge our love to one another forever. And I think about that picture when I think about us being the bride of Christ. That he's the bridegroom who can't help but think about us and love us. And that he's constantly waiting, constantly saying to the Father, is it time, is it time? Come on, when is it going to be time when I can return and be reunited with my wife, be reunited with my bride, that we can have that wedding? And man, I think about, it wasn't just like, I, I was excited about the wedding, right? But I was excited about not just the wedding, but I was excited about, whoa, what happened after the wedding? Come on, all the guys, you know what I'm talking about. I was excited about the wedding night. Come on, amen. Amen, right? And it wasn't just a wedding night, but it was even the honeymoon that we're going to have seven days where it's just the two of us and no interruptions on that cruise together. And then I, I was excited not just about that, but I was excited about what our life would be like and how we would live our life together forever. And I was thinking about that constantly. And that's what Jesus is constantly thinking about when he thinks about us, that someday he's going to return and he has prepared a place for us, that he is the bridegroom and we are the bride and one day we are going to be united and it's not just going to be about that day when he returns it's going to be about all the things that are going to happen after those days that we're going to be together forever John sees this vision and it describes what it's going to be like in verse 10 and he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And it shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of very precious jewels, like a jasper, like as crystal. And it had great high, a great high wall with 12 gates, and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And there were three gates on the east, and three on the north, and three on the south, and three on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them there were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who had talked with me had measured the rod of gold to the measuring city, its gates and its walls, and the city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. And he measured this city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 12, stasia in length and as wide and high as it was long. And the angel measured the wall using human measurements, and it was 144 cubits thick, and the wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. And the foundations of the city wall were decorated with every kind of precious stones. And the first foundation was jasper and the second sapphire and the third a gate and the fourth emerald and the fifth onyx and the sixth ruby and the seventh chrysolite and the eighth beryl and the ninth topaz and the tenth turquoise and the eleventh jacinth and the twelfth, whatever that word is, I've never even heard of some of these jewels, come on. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. And the great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. And, it did not, and I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the the glory of God gives light and the lamb is its light and the nation will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it and on no day will its gates ever be shut because there is no night there and the glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it nothing impure will ever enter into it nor anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the lamb's book of life come on I love this I know I read a whole whole lot there and there's a whole lot of detail but what I love about the detail there is that Jesus cared about every single detail he has planned it all out for us when we are able to be there with him I think about my daughter she married here in just a few months in June and she's already planned out every I mean she got her list and all every why because she loves her fiance so much she's planned every detail and that's how much Jesus loves us gates of pearl streets of gold 
Those things sound amazing, but what's even more amazing is that there'll be no more evil, no more sin, no more hurt, no more sickness, no more pain. That's the place that we are going if we know Jesus. We are his bride and he is the bride groom. Reminds me of this little story I heard one time about a little boy lived in this pier and beam house. He used to like to crawl up underneath the house and play with his little green army man. And one day as he was playing with his little army man under the house, he looked up at the bottom of the floor. If you've ever seen a wood floor from underneath, you know what it looks like. Nails or jagged, rusty nails, cobwebs, dirt. And the little boy thought to himself, it's interesting because the bottom of that floor is so ugly and yet the top is so pretty. It's stained so nicely and it's buffed out and it's shiny. And so one day he told his dad what he was thinking. And this dad in his wisdom one day brought the little boy out into a beautiful Texas night, starry sky, stars, the moon were shining so bright. The little boy's dad pointed up and said, see these stars and see how beautiful this sky is. And the little boy said, yes. And he said, son, that's just the bottom of heaven. Let me tell you, that's the place that is prepared for us as the bride of the bride and groom. And I know that we read about some judgments and some things that are hard to understand, but here's the, here's the good news, is that none of us have to face any of those judgments if we know Jesus as our Savior. If you know him as your Lord, you don't have to worry about the judgments. You can just look forward to the day when he returns. In this book of the Bible, we see Jesus for who he really is. That's why it's important that we study it, because we see him in all of his nature. We see him as the Alpha and Omega. We see him as the Lamb of God. We see him as the righteous judge. We see him as the King of kings and Lord of lords. We see him as the bridegroom and ourselves as the bride. So what do we do with all of this? I'll tell you, this is what we do. We make a decision, put our hope and our trust fully in him. And no matter what happens in the world around us, no matter how, how much we see all the turmoil and all the stuff, we just decide, I'm looking to him. I'm putting my faith and my trust in him. In fact, I'll finish with this one last passage from Revelation 22 and verse 17. It says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes to take the free gift of water of life I'm telling you here today, the reason I'm preaching on this is because I want our church, I want the church to join together with the Spirit of God, and I want this to be our heart's cry. Come, Lord Jesus. All the things of this world that we think are so important, they're really not so important, God. Help us to get our focus on you, and we ask you, God, come, Lord Jesus. And maybe there are some of you that are here in this room today, and maybe you're the ones that are going, I'm thirsty. I've tried all the things that this world has to offer, but I'm still lacking. I'm still in need. And what does the Spirit say to you? Come. Come to Him. And He can be that living water that you can drink and you will never thirst again. Thank you for joining us online today. Make sure and hit subscribe to this channel and hit the bell for more notifications. We can't wait to engage with you this week.